loving Father in heaven, you know each one. Jeff was just verbalizing his reminiscing of all the contacts, of all the wonderful people, uh, your sons and daughters that has uh, filled his life and the rest of us uh, at Future for America with, uh, well, this is what it's about, the people. And uh, we pray, dear Lord, that you will give us a spirit of self-sacrifice, that we'll see in Jesus the things that count the most, a uh, love that will not let people go, that uh, we will be united, and that we will experience, although the church militant, we will experience the church triumphant. So with that, Lord, we pray that you will please blow out, pour out your spirit on Brother Pippinger tonight. Might you pull back the curtain and allow us to see things that we have not yet been able to see because of our dull spiritual understanding, and that you will be gracious uh, to Zion. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Last night I, I realized that in the notes from last night I had left out a quote where Sister White speaks of um, the prophets in the Bible as being representative men. And so this box here is, I told you I would bring it back in, um, representative in the Webster's Day and Age uh, is defined as similitude uh, in Ellen White's Day and Age and Webster's, may still be defined that way for all I know. And in Hosea 12.10, we're told that the Lord speaks uh, through the ministry of the prophets, through similitudes, okay? So that, that was from last night. I told you that I would bring that to you. That's done. I'm still just putting some planks together for the conclusion of the presentation, which will, if it doesn't begin tomorrow, it will begin on Friday evening. Um, so one of the things we have referenced, but I, I just want to read a couple paragraphs so it is in place, is concerning the church militant, and the church triumphant. Uh, these are some notes that were in your notes from last night that we didn't get to. So under the heading on page one of church militant and triumphant, it says, has God no living church? He has a church, but it is the church militant, not the church triumphant. We are sorry that there are defective members, that there are tares amid the wheat. Jesus said, let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. It is, um, the church militant consists of wheat, wheat and tares, but there's other information in this particular quote uh, that you should mark, and that is that technically the Tares get bound first. That's what the scriptures say. And that seems like a mundane point when you're reading the parable of the wheat and tares. But when you get to the binding off period that we are dealing with and the separation process that is part of the binding off period. And if you did not follow the inferences of Noel as he was closing off his presentation, that's what he was pointing to. He was looking at characteristics of the triumphal entry of Christ and noting that one of those characteristics is the bitterness that Christ went demonstrated as he wept over Jerusalem. And he was weeping over Jerusalem, as Noel correctly pointed out, not because of what was going to take place at the cross, but because he's seen a separation taking place between the wheat and the tares. Okay, and the tares, Jerusalem of old, was being bound into a bundle to be destroyed by the Romans in AD 70. So these characteristics from the triumphal entry uh, pose, contribute to what we're understanding about the binding off period that takes place before, in, during the midnight cry 
time period in our history. So when we're talking about the church triumphant, church militant, the church triumphant is going to be made up of wheat with no tares. And this next quote from Great Controversy is a nice way to demonstrate that. Those who are living upon the earth when the intercession of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above are to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Their robes must be spotless. Their characters must be purified from sin by the blood of sprinkling. Through the grace of God and their own diligent effort, they must be conquerors in the battle with evil. While the investigative judgment is going forward in heaven, while the sins of penitent believers are being removed from the sanctuary, there is to be a special work of purification, a, of putting away of sin among God's people upon earth. This work is more clearly presented in the messages of Revelation 14. When this work shall have been accomplished, the followers of Christ will be ready for his appearing. When what work will be accomplished? When God's people put away sin, this work will be accomplished. And what we're understanding is that God's people put their sin away progressively. First, it happens among the priests, then the Levites, then the 11th hour workers. Okay, so this is a progressive work. And then it says... When this work shall be, have been accomplished, the followers of Christ will be ready for his appearing. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old, as in former years. And she references Malachi 3, 4. Then the church which our Lord at his coming is to receive to himself will be a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Then she will look forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners. And this expression from the Song of Solomon is a symbol of the church triumphant. And once you run this expression from the Song of Solomon through the spirit of prophecy, you, you can even see it there if you understand it. The church triumphant is an army, okay? It, it, it's an army with banners. So the church triumphant isn't a church that is raised up when the war is over. It's raised up at the beginning of the war. It is God's triumphant church that's going to go to battle uh, spiritually in this time period. And we're understanding now that the church triumphant comes into history at the midnight cry, not as we have previously understood at the Sunday law. Okay, so... We've, we've mentioned Joel 3.17 in connection with this. Uh, we'll read that once again. It says, so shall you... Well, let's, let's back up to verse... I think later on I'm going to read these verses. Uh, so I'll read them now. Uh, let's start at... Verse 11, assemble yourselves and come all ye heathen and gather yourselves together round about. Thither, thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened. And we're saying that this takes place at the midnight cry. The heathen don't come, come out of Babylon and stand with the Seventh-day Adventist church at the midnight cry, but they're wakened up to the issues of the image of the beast testing time and the midnight cry in the United States, and they begin to be prepared to take their stand with God's people at the Sunday law. This is the plowing, okay? Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I set to judge all the heathen round about. And we're suggesting that this valley is the valley of the two walls, the valley of uh, where Pharaoh dies with the sea on this side and the sea on this side, the east wind holding these two walls back, and uh, it creates a valley of judgment. Um, Let the heathen be wakened and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I set to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full, the fats overflow. For their wickedness is great, multitudes, multitudes. 
midnight cry, in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near. Day of the Lord is not here, it's near at the Sunday law. Um, for the day of the Lord is now near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Whatever it means that the sun and the moon shall be darkened and the stars shall withdraw their shining, it's referencing something that takes place in the valley of decision between the midnight cry and the Sunday law. Okay? And notice the next verse, and we're saying at the midnight cry, the priests have been raised up and they are the, the first fruits of the 144,000. They're the, the beginning of the church triumphant. And from that point on, no more, no more people join God's church that are going to sin and repent and sin and repent. And the next verse is identifying that, and it's identifying that as taking place at the midnight cry and onward. It says, So shall you know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no strangers and you can interchange the word strangers in the Old Testament with heathen or Gentiles. Uh, then, and there shall no strangers pass through her anymore. Okay? You don't come in and go out anymore. All right. Now go to uh, Isaiah 52.1. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion, put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city, for henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. At the midnight cry, there shall no more come into the church. It's the church triumphant, the uncircumcised or the unclean. Go to Isaiah 56. Uh, 1 through 8, and this is more about the two gatherings of Adventism and the 11th hour workers, but it fits into this thought. Verse 1 says, Thus saith the Lord, keep judgment and do justice, for my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed. His righteousness is going to be revealed at the midnight cry. And we can prove this on many lines. The the big fractal of 9-11, the midnight cry, and the Sunday law is this three-step testing process for Adventism. Okay, we know that there is a fractal in that history for the priests, but at the general level, 9-11 is the first test, the midnight cry is the second visual test, and the Sunday law is the third test. Okay, and when it says, my righteousness will be revealed, we know that the Holy Spirit came to convict the world of sin, 9-11, righteousness, the midnight cry, and judgment, the Sunday law. His righteousness is revealed at the larger level at the midnight cry. And it's revealed because this is where the church triumphant is being put into history. Okay, my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man that doeth this, and the son of man that layeth hold of it, and keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and keepeth his hand from doing any evil. Neither let the son of the stranger that hath joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I'm a dry tree. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths, and choose the things that please me, and take hold of my covenant. Even unto them will I give in mine house. And let me run something before you before we finish verse 5. If I accept Christ today, my name is put into the book of life. If I sin tomorrow, that sin is recorded in the book of sins. And if I accept Christ today, I'm, a, I'm making the assumption that we all know that that means that I'm justified through the process of repentance and confession and restitution. Then my name is in the book of life. Yes, everyone follow that. But if I would sin, it would, 
that sin would be recorded in the book of sins, but even, back to verse 5, even unto them I, will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than the sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. What cuts my name off, out or off of the book of life? Sin. Okay, Their name doesn't get cut off. They don't sin. Um, verse 6. Also the sons of a stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him, also the eleventh hour workers, and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and taketh hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon my altar, for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. The Lord God, which gathereth the outcast of Israel, and you can run the expression outcast of Israel and show that they are the ensign that gets lifted up. The Lord, which gathereth the outcast of Israel, saith, Yet will I gather the eleventh hour workers also to him, besides those that are gathered unto him. So there's two gatherings. There's two sheepfolds. Um, but this gathering process... There's no more sin and repent experience. John 10, 16. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Okay. If you're familiar with Revelation 9, and, you sh and if, if you've been in this message very long, you should be, uh, you notice that in the history of the fifth trumpet and the first woe, that there are two 150-year periods mentioned. Okay, we let's go there. If you're not just for to make sure you follow my logic, I'm not so clear. Um, in verse five of Revelation nine, Revelation nine. Verse 5 says, And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but they should be tormented five months. Okay, and in verse 10, it says, And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. Okay, so some of those among us that are the have the aptitude for looking at history or chronology or or numbers more than others of us have that aptitude, have noted that in the history of the fifth trumpet, in the time period of, I think it was Muhammad II or Abu Bakr, I don't remember the details, but there is another 150 year period early on in the history of the fifth trumpet that the pioneers did not mark. Okay, and I was shown that when I was up in Canada here not too, too many months ago, and when I was shown it, I thought, I, I stated, that's pretty cool, but I don't know what it means. Uh, I, I have a little bit tried to figure out what it means, but I, I'm not there to, to, at this point, I don't understand if it is a second period of 150 years in the history of the fifth trumpet, or if it's just a repetition for emphasis of the 150 years that we already understand. Um, and that's about all I said, but recently it it's came out based upon my statement in Canada that, that I'm endorsing this thing, whatever this thing may be, all right? And, and, but what I, recently I found out what the thing would be, and the thing is this, is that when the World Trade Center was first attacked in 1993, that this corresponds with the first 150 years and then in this timeline that we've been dealing with when we put Revelation 9 uh, under it. And I can't buy that because w once you apply that, I think that was 1993, um, the second step to the logic that's being applied by those that are seeing that is that we have identified that there was a hold placed upon Islam here, a hold here, a hold here, a hold here, and then a full release here. So if you mark another 150 year time period in the fifth trumpet, first woe 
of Revelation 9, this uh, 150 years that we start the fifth trumpet here, go to here where the torment, the first woe of the fifth trumpet begins, this new understanding is putting 1993 in here and saying, hold, hold in 93, hold. I don't know if it's saying hold here or hold here, but I want to show you why I can't buy it based upon the concept of four holds, okay? Um, it, in, in early writings, page 38, it says, Then I saw an angel with a commission from Jesus swiftly flying to the four angels who had a work to do on earth and waving something up and down in his hand and crying with a loud voice, Hold, 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 until the servants of God are sealed in their forehead. Okay, so I mentioned last night, I believe, I didn't show it to you, that when, when he, well, I mentioned this, and I think I, I, we've dealt with this. When Islam is referenced in the scriptures, it, one of its primary characteristics is when it's restrained. Okay, and this is this holding we're understanding to be Islam because Islam is that angry horse represented by the four winds represented by an angry horse seeking to break loose and bring death and destruction in its path. So we've come to understand that when these holds are put upon Islam, there is a manifestation of the power of God, okay? So I cannot identify for myself any manifestation of the power of God in 1993, okay? So I, that's one, but that's a powerful one that would prevent me from moving away from this uh, position that we've already put in place. Go to Genesis 16. Let's not go to Genesis 16. We have discussed this last night. It's in your notes, Genesis 16, 6 through 16. I'll tell you about it. You read it and test, test me. This is the second time we've discussed this. When Sarah is had enough with Hagar, Abraham gives her permission to do whatever she wants with Hagar and cast out the bondwoman. Okay, so Hagar in chapter 16 of Genesis, she's out in the desert getting ready to die because Sarah has put a restraint upon her and her son Ishmael. And what happens in that story? An angel descends, okay? And in the scriptures, when an angel descends, that is a symbol of a manifestation of the power of God. So when you see a restraint placed upon Islam, if you can see it two or three times when you see Islam restrained and you also see there's a manifestation of the power of God at that point, then you can identify that when Islam is held, you got to see a manifestation of the power of God. That's what rules out 1993, unless there is some... Something that happened in 1993 that we don't know about, uh, but the manifestation of the power of God is generally something that he makes sure everyone knows about, okay? Because he's going to hold them accountable for it because it's the sign of Jonah, all right? He's going to hold them accountable for it if you listen to the story of Jonah today in the scriptures. Revelation 7, 1 through 3, the four winds are held. This is in your notes. While God's servants are sealed... And this is the sealing of the 144,000. And when the 144,000 are sealed, there is a manifestation of the power of God because the sealing of the 144,000 begins at 9-11 when the sprinkling begins. Okay, Islam is restrained. It's held. And we're saying that Islam is held in 1989. Was there a manifestation of the power of God in 1989? What's it called? The increase of knowledge. At the time of the end, the book of Daniel was unsealed and there was an increase of knowledge. Um, and at 9-11, there was a manifestation of the power of God um, and there's a hold placed upon Islam. We're saying there's a hold placed at the midnight cry and a hold placed at the Sunday law, but fully loosed. At 
when human probation closes. Okay, in your notes, Mark covered today Isaiah 27, verse 8, the day of the east wind, and what he was dealing with there, day of the east wind being 9-11, was the budding out, because in the passage, in the day of the east wind in Isaiah 27, there's where the budding out takes place. Another reference to the beginning of the sealing of the 144,000. There's a manifestation of the power of God. What I'm, what I'm trying to show here is that when Islam is held, you will see a manifestation of the power of God. Um, Numbers 22, verses 22 to 33, has anyone here directly presented Balaam yet, or have we just referenced it because it's already a matter of public record? Marx went through Balaam, okay? We're placing Balaam here, here, and here, okay? When, when the, what happens here, the, well, I won't start at the end. I'll start at the beginning. The ass here turns Balaam out of the way. He prevents Balaam, the United States, from enacting the Sunday law. Because this is the first day of the first month, and in Ezra 7, when Ezra is coming out of Babylon on the first day of the first month, He's got the third decree in his hand, and the third decree is the Sunday law. So Balaam here has already got this, he's ready to implement the Sunday law, but the ass of Islam strikes and turns Balaam out of his way from doing what he's going to do, so the 144,000 can be sealed, and then the ass takes Balaam between two walls. I hope you've been seeing these two walls. Marriage, the Sabbath, okay? The one side of the Red Sea, the other side of the Red Sea. The one side of the Valley of Decision, the other side of the Valley of Decision. The ass is now taking Balaam into this place where these two walls are, but the ass crashes Balaam into this wall and cripples the United States cripples Balaam. And of course, when it, the United States, Balaam, it then is going to strike the ass, just like it struck the ass back here, put a restraint upon him. So we're, we're understanding here, the manifestation of the power of God is the sprinkling, but here it's doubled. That's the two lines. The restraint of Islam here, at the third strike, full outpouring. Okay? So... Then the ass, uh, and, and what is it that's making the ass do this? The angel. The angel. You, you got an angel there, right? And, and what's he got? What's an angel? Okay, who, who's the angel? God's people. And what does he have in his hand? Uh, what's he have in his hand? A wine cup, a message, all right? A writer's inkhorn. Okay, so here... He, he falls down. He takes the United States down. They end as the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy. And what's the ass do at this point? He speaks. How many speakings are here? Well, the United States speaks as a dragon. This is the perfect fulfillment of Habakkuk 2, though the vision tarry, wait for it, because it will surely speak. This is Zechariah speaking. This is the ass speaking. Then there's others. Someone help me. I'm forgetting it. There's other speakings here in any case. Yeah, I... S Never mind. There are other ones, but we don't want to guess. Okay. So I, I want to show you one other thing that's probably in the record. Go to Genesis 11. So what I'm saying, Balaam provides a second witness to the restraint of Islam at these three points and the manifestation of the power of God at these three points while contributing other information to uphold our understanding of the structure of Ezra 7, 9, Matthew 25, and Daniel 11, 40 to 45. But in Genesis 11, it seems worth putting into the record. May, I, I have a hunch Mark may have already done this, but maybe someone else did it too. Pardon me? 
Okay, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in here. But go to uh, verse 1 of Genesis 11. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there, and they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick. Now here, this is a symbol of rebellion from here on because they're going to use brick to build their church. Sister White says that tower was a temple. That tower was a church. It was not a literal tower. And a city in Bible prophecy is a state. Okay, This, this is the first mention of a tower in connection with a city in the scriptures, and it represents church and state at the end of the world because Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning, and Babel is illustrating modern Babylon at the end of the world, which is a system based upon the combination of church and state. But you can only see that if you follow Miller's rules under the guidance of the spirit of prophecy that says prophecy was seen to be a figurative delineation of events leading down to the close of this earth's history, So Nimrod and his cohorts here, they're entering into the covenant of death. Because if you are in a covenant relationship with Christ at that time period, and you're going to build a temple or an altar, you're going to do it with stones that have not been touched by human chisels. Okay, But these guys, they made bricks, and they used mortar. You were supposed to just put the stones one upon another. This is the covenant of death that is being formed by the rebels at the end of the world. And verse 3 says, and said one to another, go to. Look at verse 4. And they said, go to. And look at verse 7. It says, go to. There's three go to's in here. Okay? And whenever you see three in the scriptures, almost always it's a symbol of the three angels' messages. And one of the things that we understand about the three angels' messages is that the first two tests, the first and second angels' messages, are different than the third, because the third, you haven't got any probation. The third is where you manifest the character that you've developed, that you finalized during the testing process of the first two. And you'll notice that the first two go-tos in this passage are the expression of Nimrod and his followers. Let's, let's go build this with brick, go to. And the second, let's go build a church and state. The second, a church and state, a city and a tower. Okay, the first is the corrupted covenant. You're supposed to enter into a covenant with the Lord here by eating the little book, go to. This is a group of people that says, no, man, we're going to do it our own way. You know, and, and then they get here, go to, let's build the image of the beast, a church and a tower. But the third go-to, it's different. It's not Nimrod and his friends. This is the Lord saying, go down, let's execute judgment. Okay, so you got the three go-to's, go to, go to, go to, and they line up just as perfectly as Balaam striking the ass here, here, and here. And let me show you one more thing in there before we move on. If you're following this, I hope you're following what I'm suggesting. Uh, There are two, maybe it's in my notes, verses 3, 4, 5, and 7. Verse 5, And the Lord came down to see the children and the tower. And verse 7, The the, the city and the tower, which the children of men builded, And in verse 7, it says, let us go down. Okay, so here the Lord is coming down to investigate this and this. He's coming down. What's it mean that the Lord's coming down? There's an angel coming down, and there's a manifestation of the power of God in agreement with hold, 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 hold and in agreement with the angel being at all three of these waymarks with uh, Balaam, okay? So in Revelation 9, 15, the prophecy of the 391 years and 15 days that in the Millerite history 
ended here on August 11th, 1840. Was there an angel that came down there? Was there a manifestation of the power of God? Okay, so when there's a restraint placed upon Islam, upon several witnesses from several directions, you see a manifestation of the power of God. So if someone's teaching you that down here in 1993, there's another way mark that we need to include into this history, you tell them, well, where was the manifestation of the power of God? And there, I really don't think they're going to produce one. Okay, but that is, I'm not just trying to refute that teaching. I'm wanting you to see the structure of the hold, 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 what takes place when there's a hold placed upon Islam and how it lines up with Balaam and Genesis 11. Sister White says, under those references to in scripture references, it says angels are holding the four winds represented by an angry horse seeking to break loose. You know, she's, she's identifying that that angry horse is restrained. It's seeking to break loose. When Islam is marked, it's generally marked as being restrained. It's, it's primary characteristics. And rush over the face of the whole earth, bearing destruction and death in its path. Shall we sleep on the very verge of the eternal world? Shall we be dull and cold and dead? Oh, that we might have in, the chur in our churches the spirit and breath of God breathed into his people, that they might stand upon their feet and live we need to see that the way is narrow and the gate is straight, but as we pass through the straight gate, its wilderness is without limit. Without what? Its wideness. What did I say? Wilderness. wilderness. Okay. I'm, i got to focus on the reading and quit trying to think about other things while I'm reading. Its wideness is without limit. Okay, so notice from early writings, an explanation that Sister White's making about a comment that she made earlier in the book about the time of trouble. It says on page 33 is given the following, and she quotes what she has quoted from page 33 of that same book. Now in the second paragraph, she's going to explain that paragraph. She says, this view was given in 1847, wherein there were but few of the Advent brethren observing Sabbath. And of these, but few suppose that its observance was of sufficient importance to draw a line between the people of God and unbelievers. Now the fulfillment of that view is beginning to be seen. The commencement of that time of trouble here mentioned does not refer to the time when the plague shall be poured out. Here's a time of trouble right here, what we call the great time of trouble. And she's going to, even though she never uses the expression little time of trouble, she's going to explain now the little time of trouble she says, the commencement of that time of, trouble, time of trouble here mentioned does not refer to the time when the plague shall begin to be poured out, but to a short period just before they're poured out while Christ is in the sanctuary. In the sanctuary. At that time, while the work of salvation is closing, and the work of salvation is the sealing of God's people, both the Adventists and the eleventh hour workers. This is the closing work of the gospel. From here to here, okay? So she's talking about the closing work. Uh, at that time, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming upon the earth. Have you seen any trouble coming on the earth since 9-11? Okay, uh, and the nations will be angry. Are the nations angry? Um, did, did you know that, I don't know if it was yesterday or the day before, <laughs> that the Pope put his blessing upon this uh, peace treaty that Obama made with Iran. Not a peace treaty, but this treaty about nuclear weapons. Yeah. Pope doesn't have a problem that Iran is going to eventually throw a nuclear bomb towards Jerusalem, okay? Um, at that time, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming on the earth, and the nations will be angry, yet held in check. At, at what time? While the work is sal of salvation is closing, the nations are going to be held in check so as not to prevent the work of the third angel. They're held in check right here. At that time, what? The latter rain comes. Okay, when she's, ag she's agreeing with what I just said. When Islam is restrained, there's a manifestation of the power of God. Okay, you're going to see it at every point in time. I didn't see one in 1993. 
Okay, different, different subject now. What, what was I doing there? I was putting in place the church triumphant um, and the four holds and what takes place at each of those holds. Now I want to consider raising up a priesthood. That's what's going on here, brothers and sisters. The, the leadership let's say the political leadership, the leadership, the leadership of Seventh-day Adventist Church is passed by here. And, there, and Sister White repeatedly says there's only two classes. And when you talk about the parable of the ten virgins, what are the two classes? The wise and virgins. But Sister White talks about a third class in the parable of the ten virgins, right? Okay. The hypocrites are not foolish virgins, she says. Okay, so there's hypocrites. These, when you are part of God's church, but you reach the close of your probation, when you're passed by, you become a hypocrite, okay? Not, not a derogatory term about your character. I'm talking about what you are now symbolized as prophetically. In this history, the wise and foolish priests are in their shaking process, and when the wise priests are lifted up as an ensign in this history, the foolish priests cease to be foolish virgins, and they become hypocrites right here. Okay? And when you get to hear the, those Levites that have rejected the warning method, message are no longer foolish Levites, they become hypocrites. Okay? Once you're done with the testing process, and you're still alive, you're no longer a foolish virgin. You've been separated. Now you become a hypocrite. Um, this here is the place where the Lord is raising up the church triumphant. He's going to establish a new priesthood right here. Okay. Joel 3, 9 through 16. Okay, I'm only going to read 9 and 10 because we've already read. 11 through 17. And we've identified this passage as where? Well, based upon verse 14, midnight cry, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Verse 12, at the midnight cry, this is where the heathen are awakened. And therefore, in verse 9, it says, Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles, prepare for war, wake up the mighty men, and let all the men of war draw near, let them come up, beat your plowshares into swords, and your pruning hooks into spears, let the weak say, I am strong. You will see as we proceed, Lord willing, that what the binding off period is teaching us, among other things, is that when you get to the third angel's test, if you are found to be a wise priest, a wise virgin, you will manifest that character. You're sealed for eternity in terms of your salvation. If you die, you're going to be saved. If you lived, you're going to live till for eternity. Okay? When you get to that place, you will manifest that you have prepared a character for eternity. And at this point, you are going to have a message to proclaim. All right? This binding off period, it takes the, those that have been successful in the process of the everlasting gospel, and it prepares them to give a message to the Levites. And, and then the Levites go through this same process, and they're prepared to give the loud cry message to the Gentiles. So as we go through the dynamics of what takes place in the binding off period, you find that one of the things that's being marked there is the preparation of the messengers to proclaim, in this history, the message of the midnight cry. So what I'm telling you here, if you want to see it, it we're trying to figure out exactly what that message is because Josiah Litch leaves in the historical record that we're going to make a prediction in advance of an event that's going to make us look foolish, but when that event takes place, it's going to lift us up into the public attention because the world is going to suddenly see that they're in a tremendous crisis. And there was one small little group that had not only been predicting this crisis, but they also are predicting a greater crisis. 
So if you're at multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision here in Joel, we know that at least part of our message is there in verse 9. Prepare for war. There's a war coming. Of course, Sister White says, in the last days, wars will rage. Verse 9 says, proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Okay, so this is the time period here. Don't know who's covered it. But this is Manasseh, all right? Um, Ammon, the architect, is in this history. The... Christ making the blueprint to build this temple, all right? And then the foundational work is put in place, 1996, the Time of the End magazine. And the foundational approach to this prophetic message is put in place, and this is the building of the temple, which took place by preparing all the stones outside of Jerusalem, and once every stone was prepared, then it's taken into Jerusalem and it's built right here. This is where the, the foundation is laid. This is where it's prepared. Foundational message, 1833 for the Millerites, 1996 for this history. Then you get here to Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, Zedekiah. But if you know the last seven kings of Israel and the joining of the two sticks, you know the seventh to the last king comes into history right here with Jeroboam II, which means controversy and the second flock and some other things. One of the main other things is that Jeroboam II has to have a relationship with Jeroboam I. And the thing about Jeroboam I, the thing that he did right when he started his kingship, is he built two calves like Aaron, and it was definitely a take-off take of Aaron. He expresses the very same words. These are the gods that brought you out of Egypt. But he doubles them up right here, Jeroboam too, because that truth about Jeroboam he gets from his forefather, Jeroboam the first. This is the image of the beast. Jeroboam the first is symbol of the image of the beast. Jeroboam 2, image of the beast comes in here. This is where the heathen are being awakened. And what are we going to tell the Gentiles here? One of the things we're going to tell them is right here. There's a war coming. And it's what the secular world calls the third world war. This is it. That's part of the message. According to Joel chapter 3. Okay, if you can see it. So in Acts... Chapter 3, so I'm saying that when the priesthood's getting raised up, they're getting raised up to present a message. Uh, they're going to predict a message and then present, present the message to the world, and this is part of the dynamics of bringing them into the focus of the world. Yesterday, we read through these verses, and I won't read through all of them because I'm already over time pretty much. Um, what I want you to consider is verse 22 of Acts chapter 3. We know this is the refreshing. We know that Jesus comes here uh, to mark the times of refreshing. And in verse 22 it says, For Moses truly said unto your father, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up. When the prophet comes in, he's raised up. Don't forget the word raise, because in the binding off period, there is a raising that takes place. <clears throat> unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet, and what I'm saying, brothers and sisters, that prophet is the angel in linen, with the writer's inkhorn. He gets raised up. He gets raised up right here. He's going to go through this history and put a mark upon those that are sighing and crying for the things that are going on in Adventism. But if that message is not received, in Ezekiel 9, what happens? The five wise priests from this history are going to destroy him. Okay? So notice that verse that we jumped out of. Um, 
verse 23, and it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people by those five destroying angels. And then there's a reference made to Samuel. It says, EA and all the prophets from Samuel and those that followed after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold these days. 1 Samuel 2. 1 Samuel 2. Let's go look at Samuel. I really did try to shrink this down where I could get done. Verse 26 of chapter 2 of 1 Samuel. And the child Samuel grew on and was in favor both with the Lord and also with man, men. And there came a man of God unto Eli and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest? This is about the priesthood, is it not? To offer upon my, mine altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me. And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Wherefore, kick ye at my sacrifice and mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me, to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of the offerings of Israel. Israel, my people, wherefore the Lord God of Israel said, this is a prophet that's coming to Eli with this message, wherefore the Lord God of Israel said, I said indeed that thy house and the house of, their fa of thy father should walk before me forever, but now the Lord saith, be it far from me, for them that honor me will I, I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, and there shall not be an old man in thine house. Okay, so all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world, and the Lord raised up Moses in that history, and Moses typified Christ, but in the book of Acts, it's saying that there is going to be a prophet raised up at the end of the world that has been typified by both Christ and Moses, and if you reject that message, the five wise priests are going to destroy you. Are you following my logic? And the prophet's message there from Ezekiel 9 is the cup that's marking this is your probationary time. You either accept this message or reject this message, and based upon what you do with it, you're coming to the close of your probation. Okay, so Eli here is given this same warning message and it's being placed in the future. Um, and let's read, jump down to verse 34. And this shall be a sign unto thee that shall come upon thy two sons on Hophni and Phinehas in one day, the Sunday law, they shall die, both of them, and I will... Raise up a faithful priest that shall do according that which is in mine heart and in my mind, and I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before mine anointed forever, and it shall come to pass that every one that is left in thine house shall come and crouch to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread, and shall say, Put me, I pray thee, into one of the priest's offices that I may eat a piece of bread. But it's too late for that. Okay, so this is about the priesthood. This story is about the priesthood. Okay, and now in the next chapter, which is continuing on, it's going to tell the story of Samuel being established as the new priest in place of Eli and Hophni and Phinehas. So it's, it's this transition time. And go to verse 10, because of time. Verse 10 of chapter 3, I'm sorry. It says, And the Lord came and stood and called at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I do a thing in Israel, at which both the ears of every one that heareth it shall tingle. There's only three places in the scriptures where people's, where ears tingle. Okay, And they're all talking about the destruction of Jerusalem or the 
25, 20, that, that all, they're talking about things that are marking the Sunday law where Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas die. So Samuel is given a vision that tells the same story. It's a second witness as the prophet already told Eli. And it's about the coming separation that Christ wept over right here. At the triumphal entry, Christ is weeping over this separation that takes place as Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas die and Samuel is raised up as the priest. Of course, Samuel is going to be raised up as the priest right here. Why? Samuel, Samuel. Okay. Now, n notice in verse 1, it says of chapter 3, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. Okay. Now, brothers and sisters, some of you the other day when we just brought up this concept, it, it seemed as though you didn't understand it. And even in some discussions afterwards, I think the majority of us understand it. But I guarantee if you study it out, it's a, it's a simple teaching in the scriptures. When the church is pure, every gift is active. The gift that is not active in the Seventh-day Adventist church at this time is this, maybe plenty, but the one we're talking about here is the spirit of prophecy. Okay, it ended in 1915. But when the church triumphant is restored, every gift is going to be active, and the gift of the spirit of prophecy is restored. Okay, and this is part of the story of Samuel that I'm not getting to tonight. We're going to come back to the story of Samuel. This is start, part of the story of the binding off period. But <clears throat> notice verse 15. You all know this story, right? How many times does the Lord call Samuel in this story? Four times. But it's a 3-1 combination. The first three times, Samuel goes into Eli and says, you call me? But the third time, Eli figures it out. That is not me calling you. If, 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 you, if he calls you again, you answer, I, I'm hearing you, Lord. Okay, so it's, it's a 3-1 combination because that fourth time is, a, is different even though it's the same. Okay, and a 3-1 combination is a symbol that places you right here in this history. Okay, Advent history. And in verse 15, it says, And Samuel lay unto morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. Okay, and the vision is the vision that explains to him the, the prophecy that makes your ears tingle. You know... It's, it's hard to tell someone a rebuke, okay? It, it's probably even harder to say, the Lord just told me that you and you two sons are going to die, okay? But it's, it's even harder if you're a child, okay? How old was Samuel when this took place? Twelve years old. And he, it's going to be Samuel, Samuel. And what I want to close with here this evening, <laughs> we didn't get close. Um, and here's the quote on the same page in the box that I referred to. I don't have to read that, where I said that Sister White compares Capernaum with the Seventh-day Adventist church and says it's going to hell because of the light it's rejected. Okay, I mentioned that quote, and I'm just, it's available for you now. But in this history, this vision... that Samuel receives, it's not the Chow's own vision, it's not the Mare vision, it's the Mara vision. And the Mara vision is the vision that marks the binding off period, which is the third angel. And the Mara vision is the vision that is given to everyone or anyone that is given the gift of the spirit of prophecy. Okay, the Bible teaches that if the Lord's going to raise up a prophet, he's going to do so by giving them this vision. And Samuel gets this vision right here. The spirit of prophecy is restored right here. 
based upon several witnesses. This is just part of it. And this is what we'll be looking at over the next few days. We never got to the wheels within the wheels. Or yeah, you know, the, I, I get it. There's, there's always some of us that say, let's do it. And then there's some of us sitting in the seat. Why are they saying that when I've been sitting in these seats all day long for three days? And, and by the way, the, the seats in this church are some of the most uncomfortable seats in the world, are they not? Okay, and it's a, I mean, I've had worse, but I get it all week long in these hard old seats. That's why we try to get some cushions in here. But I, I also, I don't ever tell anyone that's complaining about how hard they are. I don't tell them this. It's kind of good. It helps to keep you awake because what gets, what gets taught in this sanctuary is something generally that you want to understand and you want to be awake for. So, I mean, it goes two ways. But when someone's saying, go ahead, take another 10 minutes, there's always a few people out there saying, oh, please don't, man. I'm ready to go home and do whatever I'm going to do at home. But if I could get through the last two pages in Four or five minutes, would you be offended? <laughs> okay, so I, I still have some things to do on page four, but I will get to them. But I want to I want to talk about the wheels. Brothers and sisters, this is a wheel, this is a wheel, this is a wheel, this is a wheel, this is a wheel. Okay, you got to see this because I want you to see what happens when the prophets go in the sanctuary. Prophets like Ezekiel, and he sees wheels within wheels. And, he, and he, at first, it's all confusion, Sister White says, but it comes into perfection as he considers it. Okay, this is the wheels within wheels. So in your top quote, it says there are periods. This is a period. Okay, and, but it's a it's a point. We're going to deal with that. But she says there are periods which are turning points in the history of the nation and the church. Okay. In the providence of God, when these different crises arrive, the light for that time is given. There's light given here for this history. There's light given here. There's light given here. There's light given here. I assume there's light given here, but there is definitely a manifestation of the power of God in the seven last plagues. Um, but they're all turning points, okay? So I just want to refer you to a quote that, that Brother Mark's already put in the record, right? That in 1989, it was a turning point with Ben Laden and Islam. And in 1989, which, what happened at, in Afghanistan? That 10-year war ended. Okay, and we don't, we're so overwhelmed with Palmoni that we take note of these numbers. Not sure what that 10 year war represents, but 1989 is a turning point. It, and then, where you see 9 11, this is a, a matter of public record. It says, When Christ forbade, forbade the people to declare him king, he knew that a turning point in his history was reached. When did they want to proclaim him king? When they realized that he had the ability to take one loaf of bread and feed an army. Okay, he could do what? He could feed an army. What else could he do? He could raise the dead. So a wounded so soldier or a dead soldier, he can bring him back to life. He can heal him. Which means, what can we do? We can go conquer Rome, no sweat. So the end of ancient Israel, you see this lust by the rebels to proclaim Christ king because they want a worldly kingdom and they want the glory of conquering Rome. And this has been typified at the beginning of ancient Israel when the rebels during the 40 years after they were told to tarry for 40 years and the Lord would give them Jerusalem through his power, and they realized they were destined to wander in the wilderness for 40 years, that they took the work into their own hands, and they decided to go try to take the promised land in their own strength. They're going to go conquer Rome because of their self, 
uh, because of their self, and they get so slowly defeated. So this turning point here over the bread is a distinction between those that are going to accomplish the work through their own human strength or those that are going to tarry during the sealing time of the 144,000 and trust that the Lord's going to bring Jericho down at the Sunday law through his own strength. But nevertheless, that was a turning point right there at 9-11 in the scriptures. Next quote, also a matter of public, public record. Christ's discourse in the synagogue of Capernaum concerning the bread of life was the turning point in the history of Judas. Here we can use Judas in this history to illustrate both the rebellion of the 144,000 and the rebellion of the priest in the fractal level. But Judas' rebellion begins here at the synagogue of Capernaum. And when Sister White's writing this, what's the chapter that we find this in in the Desire of Ages? The crisis in Galilee. And what does Galilee mean? Turning point. And what was that quote? There are points, there are periods, which are turning points in the history of the nation and of the church in the providence of God when these different crises arrive. So when Sister White titles that chapter, The Crises of Galilee, it's the crisis at the turning point and here, if you read this, read it. You want to see what happened over the past three or four years in this movement? Read what Judas does from this point onward to try to destroy the prophetic message because it's what's been going on. If you're not aware of it, do some web searches. It's factual, okay? Um, hurt not, next quote. <clears throat> It was a turning point in the life of Joseph when his ten sons, ten brothers, sold him to the Islamic Ishmaelite traders, which did what for him? <clears throat> they saved his life. They took him into Egypt. Okay? Islam here is saving Joseph. Who's Joseph typifying? Us. The, hopefully us. The wise virgins. Okay? And then there's another turning point in the life of Joseph, which is probably best understood as taking place in the Millerite history, that there was a recognition of William Miller's rules of prophetic interpretation. They worked, okay? They, they, could, they could draw conclusions from the Bible that no one else could see. And the baker and the butler were in prison in the Millerite history with Joseph and Joseph said, remember me when you go before the king. I want to get out of jail. And what did the butler do? He forgot. Okay. But down here, the butler's going to remember and he's going to bring Joseph back into history at 9-11 because Pharaoh's going to need to understand this period of time where there's seven years of plenty and then there is a great famine that's caused by what? Islam, an east wind. Islam strikes here again. Okay, so a turning point. <clears throat> there was a turning point in Millerite history, and that's all in place. Okay, read it, check it out, see if I'm applying it correctly. I have a couple more things to put in place. Then, Lord willing, we're going to start dealing directly with the binding off period, and I will be able to hold you accountable for the things I put in place to uphold the logic that I will use. I will also hold you accountable, not that I can do anything about it, but I also hold you accountable to all the other presentations that have been going on here that will also contribute to what we're dealing with in the binding off period. Um, I think I covered it all. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you brought us halfway through these meetings. Uh, I particularly pray for uh, those of us that have uh, been working behind the scenes in these meetings. The, the sisters primarily that have been preparing the meals, uh, the brothers that have been keeping the maintenance up on uh, the church facility, the brothers that have been recording these things. And uh, I ask that you'd bless those 
laborers, strengthen them that they can carry on their service to the end of the work. And I, th I thank you, we all thank you for allowing them to serve in this fashion. I thank you for the obvious presence of your Holy Spirit as you have been opening these truths to our understanding. I thank you that you've been bringing these presentations together, um, binding them together into one complete message. Thank you for the brothers and sisters that have sacrificed to be here, and I ask that you would put this in a book of remembrance that uh, we did our due diligence to be here uh, to feed upon this word at this time in Earth's history because we can tell we're on the verge of a repetition of the midnight cry in the Millerite history, and we want to be part of those that swell the cry right into the loud cry. Please continue to allow your presence to be recognized and felt among us, and as we break the meeting this evening, we ask once again for traveling mercies, and especially that we might get to where we're going and get settled in for a, a night's rest that you might refresh us. We know that there are other people still heading this direction. We ask for continued traveling mercies for them. And as we come to the point in these studies when we are approaching our consideration of the binding off period, I ask that you'd give us clarity and discernment to see the seriousness of this message and the implications for each of us as individuals. And I thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You're the light, you're the light, God.